What's the highest number that can be written? We could keep adding nines until the end of the universe. But mathematicians have come up with ways to condense numbers to save ink and to be easier on the eyes. For instance, 3 plus 3 plus 3, 3 3 times, is equal to 3 times 3. And 3 times 3 times 3 is equal to 3 to the power of 3. Now that's as far as we learn in grade school. But what is 3 to the power of 3 to the power of 3? Well, let's first look at how big this number is. 3 to the power of 3 to the power of 3 is 3 to the power of 27, which is 7.63 times 10 to the power of 12. 7.63 trillion, just with three digits. And if we added just one more three up here, it would be three to the power of 7.63 trillion, a number so big we could not write it conventionally. We would never run into something in our lives where this big of a number applies. But mathematicians don't care too much about what's practical, and they decided to keep going. We can write, we can write 3 to the power of 3 to the power of 3 as 3 arrow 3. And we can write 3 arrow 3 arrow 3 as 3 double arrow 3. And 3 double arrow 3 double arrow 3 is equal to 3 triple arrow 3. And because mathematicians want to save as much ink as possible, they simplify it to 3 arrow 3, meaning 3 arrows, 3. So the highest number that could be written in the entire future of the universe is if we wrote 9 arrow, 9 arrow, 9 arrow, 9 arrow, and so on for two-thirds of the remaining time in the universe and for the last third wrote nines all the way down the other side. That is the biggest number that could ever be written. But infinity is as far away from this number as it is from one. Infinity may seem like it doesn't make that much sense in physics because if you are somewhere or sometime, then you're not at infinity. So the idea of being beyond infinity seems like nonsense. The ancient Greek philosophers thought so too. Zeno of Elia proposed a number of thought experiments, one of which is the race course paradox. In order to finish a race, one must first run half the distance, then half the remaining distance, then half the remaining distance again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and have to continue doing this an infinite number of times before they could finish a race. What the ancient Greeks concluded from this, and other experiments like it, is that motion is impossible. Man, I respect philosophy. But seriously, if we don't want to come to this absurd conclusion, we have to question some of the other assumptions that go into the thought experiment. One such possibility is that it is possible for things to happen after an infinite sequence of events. Here's a number line from 1 to 10. Suppose we want to list all those half steps between 0 and 1, so let's rescale our number line. Whoa! There are an infinite number of fractions in this range, which means the number 1 is now infinitely far away. So what does this mean for the number 2? It is now past infinity. Now, does this mean that things that happen at number 2 no longer happen? No, of course not. How do we see what happens at number 2? How do we represent what happens at number 2? Well we rescale our numbers back to us. Now, of course, this is just playing with math. It has no relevance to physical reality, right? A black hole has gravity so strong that light cannot escape from it. This gravity dilates time, like all gravitational sources do, and the closer an object gets to the event horizon, the slower time passes around it 
until at the event horizon, time is stopped. Now we may think that we can conclude from this that nothing can ever fall into a black hole, because if time slows down to stopped at the event horizon, then logically nothing could ever pass the event horizon. However, the size of an event horizon depends on the black hole's mass, and there comes a point when the falling object gets so close to the event horizon that its mass plus the mass of the black hole creates a new event horizon outside the object. And so the object is inside the black hole, and the black hole has grown. The point is that the event horizon is not just a surface in space, but a moment in time. Time equals infinity. And everything that happens inside the black hole happens after time equals infinity for the rest of the universe. We can represent this with a Penrose diagram. We take all of time and space, well, one dimension of space where one of the ends is on the event horizon of the black hole, and compress it, rescale it down so that all of time and space is within a diamond. This edge of the diamond is the infinite past. This edge of the diamond is the white hole horizon, which doesn't actually exist, it's not really a thing. This edge of the diamond is the black hole's event horizon, and this edge of the diamond is time equals infinity. These two edges of the diagram have been scaled so that infinity has been brought to us, like the number line when we brought one back to us. We know the inside of the black hole exists, and if we follow the math into the event horizon, we find another section of the Penrose diagram which we can attach to the event horizon. Here, space and time have been inverted. Outside the black hole, the singularity at the center is a point in space. But inside the black hole, the singularity is a moment in time. Everything goes toward the singularity as surely as everything moves toward the future. We can also see from this diagram why light can't escape. Light travels in 45 degree straight lines in this diagram, so we follow those, they go into the black hole, but they cannot go out, they end on the singularity. Now, you might argue that it's cheating to say that what happens inside the black hole happens after time equals infinity. After all, if you fall into a black hole, you can get there. I would argue that still counts, because if we solve the equations for time as we get closer and closer to the event horizon, time gets larger and larger, and the limit at the event horizon, time goes to infinity. And inside the event horizon, if we solve for time, we don't even get a real number. But I won't push this further, because we're not done yet. We notice that if a light beam doesn't fall into the black hole, and it doesn't get absorbed by anything, it just keeps going this way forever. And it looks like if we take a pencil, we can just draw it going off the top left edge of the diagram. Now, that's silly, because light travels at the speed of light, and the top left edge of the diagram is time equals infinity. So light will continue to move toward it at a constant speed, which is represented on the diagram as slowing down eternally and never reaching that border. And maybe that's true. But when we take into account special relativity, something bizarre happens. When something moves at speeds comparable to the speed of light, space contracts and time dilates. The closest stellar system to ours, Alpha Centauri, is 4.7 light years away. That means it takes light four years to get there. If we get on a ship and fly close to the speed of light, then in our subjective reference frame, space contracts, making that distance much shorter, and we get there in much less than 4.7 years of subjective time. However, people on Earth and people on the planets at Alpha Centauri would still calculate that it takes us longer than 4.7 years to get there. Both sets of calculations and experiences are equally true. That's what special relativity tells us. There is no preferred reference frame. Moving at speeds comparable to light speed literally rescales space and time around us. And in the limit, as something approaches the speed of light, the infinite future and the infinite forward compress 
into a single moment. This means that in the frame of reference of a photon which travels at the speed of light, the beginning of its journey and the end point of its journey are the same moment and the same place. So, in the reference frame of a photon, what happens if it never hits anything? If there is no end point to its journey, it could be that all of the infinite future is compressed into a single moment, and that photon reaches some new kind of space-time continuum beyond infinity. The physicist Roger Penrose, whom the Penrose diagram is named after, took this idea seriously and calculated what would happen in that space-time after infinity. And what he discovered from his equations is that it would be a new big bang. This theory is called conformal cyclic cosmology, and Penrose and his collaborators looked for patterns in the cosmic microwave background of our Big Bang that might have come from a previous infinitely long universe. The evidence they found has been discredited, yet conformal cyclic cosmology remains on the shelf of plausible theories that might explain the origin of our universe. If the idea of something happening after infinite time still doesn't make sense to you, remember that physics has shown us time and time again that our intuitions are not very good at accurately describing what reality is really like, from relativity to quantum physics to statistical mechanics. When the math of an idea works, we have the responsibility to question our intuitions and open our minds to the possibility that we might be wrong. It could be that we exist in a space-time that is happening after the infinite time span of a previous universe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.